<coughs> Hello, uh, B. انت انت الناس لما تي You're our first guest. Welcome. Hello, good morning. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I might not have a good sound set up, so I apologize if I. That's have. perfectly okay. fine. We will just um, give participants another couple of minutes, and then we should start. Uh, I see that uh, Mata is also here. Hello, Mata. <clears throat> Hello, Tarsicio. Okay. So, Sarah, shall we uh, begin or shall we give it another couple of minutes? What do you think? I think just give it a couple of minutes for people okay. like uh, sure. to come. Yeah. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. We're glad that you're joining us, Sarah and I, in this session. We shall start slowly and give people the opportunity to join. Uh, I was glad to have been invited by Sarah to join her in this uh, session today, in which we will be talking about uh, face recognitions and its uh, effects on societies. Sarah has prepared a couple of uh, case studies and uh, an overview that uh, I believe you will find very interesting and informative and hopefully you will find the session joyful as well let me start by telling you a little bit uh, about sarah introducing sarah to you um, so sarah is a researcher in digital rights with a master's degree uh, in digital media from the university of sussex her studies focus primarily on digital rights intersecting with human rights and gender studies. Her academic research has varied from critical analysis of how data is captured and disseminated in social media to the impact of women's representation in technology on code bias, machine learning and recognition technology, and their human rights implications. In 2021, Sara launched a podcast in Arabic titled Talknology in which uh, she tackles uh, technology, human rights, and the destructive effects of new technology on people's rights. She has been involved in several studies, uh, including fostering freedom online and the role of internet intermediaries with the UNESCO and uh, ranking digital rights, as well as diversity in the Egyptian media with the Media Diversity Institute, among others. 
And my name is Ahmed Gharbeya. My work falls in the intersection of information technology, security, and rights, with a focus in, on Egypt and uh, the MENA, in addition to being an advocate of open knowledge and everything that is decentralized, distributed, and autonomous. Um, during the session, uh, I'll be glad to redirect your questions, which you can type in the shout box here in the chat to Sarah. Uh, and uh, depending on the flow, we might also uh, have time. I think we, we should uh, have some time for comments and interventions from the audience. Um, are you ready, Sarah? Let's start by... Uh, a brief uh, definition of uh, a brief description of your work, uh, perhaps uh, a general scope. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Uh, thank you, Ahmed, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, we are mainly covering or talking or studying and researching about uh, about surveillance and using the new technology in surveillance and how that affect uh, people's life. I'm looking into the governmental use and the the cooperation between governments and company in uh, exporting this kind of technology or surveillance technology and how it's affecting people's life. So, and a part of this, a big part of it, like uh, focusing on facial recognition technology, which uh, is a new fashion of surveillance. And uh, from my point of view, is the most dangerous because it's so discreet, unforeseen, and it could it could goes without people without without uh, people notice. So, uh, and this is what why they using it heavily because it happens without people consent or barrier pre-consent. Yeah. Um, uh, can I ask you, Sarah, to give us a, a, a brief definition of the subject of your study, which is uh, recognition? Uh, does recognition always mean facial recognition or are there other aspects to the technology and use cases? Uh, I mean, does it Primer is it primarily concerned with the identification of, of facial features and how people look like, like the way we, we do when we identify people, or are there other forms of identification that's also that of, that's also involved in surveillance and that is uh, implemented uh, using uh, computers and cameras? Yeah, uh, you're right, Ahmad. It's uh, recognition technology. It doesn't mean only facial recognitions. Because recognitions could be like the eye recognition, which uh, which has been used before, had been used before the iris, and they now they started to shifting the the recognition to facial recognitions, and there is a voice recognitions, there is recognitions with the, the fingerprint, and it's all of this stuff. It could be under the biometric data or biometric recognitions, but the unique in the face like. You that the ability to find people faces everywhere and the easy, the easy, how it's easy to access them, whether in the street, in airport, and whatever. We didn't find our voices normally uh, all over the internet or all over the street. We can't find our fingerprints everywhere, but the accessibility of find everyone faces is is huge. And the ability to harvest right. and to get all these data from the internet without 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 any literally any big effort is so mm -hmm. easy. So it's like mm -hmm. it's like a leap in recognition technology, which right. make it so so a danger. Yes, I I uh, I think I also read something recently about the technology of evolving to allow not only the identification of features. Uh, but also of uh, stance of uh, of how a person walks, so that even if the um, if the conditions in the image are not um, useful enough to identify features of the face, or if of individuals uh, resolve to uh, camouflaging or hiding their faces, um, there are means that are being developed now that allow the identification of persons from the way they walk, 
uh, from basically their body language, uh, like how I'm moving my hands now when I'm talking. So if there is enough footage of me doing this in public, yeah. there is a good chance that systems maybe now or in the near future will be able to identify me even when I wear a mask, which is uh, really something, right? Um, exactly. I want to add something. It's it's not uh, yeah to add like the the movement. It's like it's protect your movement and it's try to read your your body language and imagine imagine the differences of body language from culture to culture, and just to it's it will be implement implemented with the race because because in some culture we like in Middle East or whatever we use our hands many uh, more more often than people like maybe not used to not used to use their hands so imagine if i am if the camera like um, detected me like doing like a, a, a suddenly movement we, I, they could alarm the security because of something like i'm laughing so much and doing uh, so loudly and and like waving my yeah. hand or doing a kind of like um yeah. Like the movement, it's not it's not normal, or or the or the camera, the data training is not uh is not identified uh -huh. or training on it, and it's it's really it's really connected to the race because they used to say like they they like like um like like in in Western or USA they said like like black people uh body language is different than the white people right. so imagine if you trained the camera on on a specific movement and it's not uh, it's not aligned with uh, with any other people's or culture's movement so right. how risk will be all these people will be under so you mean that racial profiling uh, exactly. opportunities are even more and discrimination and, okay. and like and like it's it's even it's uh, is there is something called uh, emotion analysis so with the features of my face and the movement moving of my feature of my of my of my nose face eyebrows eyes they could analyze my feelings but again right. it's all this is all these things differentiate from it's different from person to person and from culture to culture. So right. how it happened? Um, and uh, um, speaking of uh, cultures and um, uh, different regions of the world, um, I I know your work is focused mainly on uh, the region of the Middle East and North Africa. Um, with a focus in Egypt, is this correct? Yeah. So um, perhaps you would uh, like to tell us a little bit about uh, what we or uh, what is known about uh, the developments in this domain, uh, in this region? Uh, to be honest, it, the facial recognition technology is now like the, 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 the global new fashion. And the most debate that you could find of this and um, talks about facial recognition technology in Western countries. You could find debates about it in UK. You could find debates about it in France, in, in US, and a lot okay. of initiative and engaging from the society, despite that many of people didn't know about it yet or didn't acknowledge the risk of using uh, facial recognition technology in public places and in under an unconstructive environment. But the most <laughs> dangerous things like, like while people didn't talk about it in MENA, it doesn't mean like the government didn't operate it or not right. using it because, because these countries are using this technology without people consent, without the pre-informing people of, of applying or deploying this technology. In UK, okay. for example, if you're gonna use this technology, at least, which is not perfect, at least, the police car put uh, a sign saying this, we are doing facial recognition technology. This, we are making surveillance CCT with, with, with facial recognition technology in this area. So at least people know, but that's happened discreetly and without people uh, consent. And even the exporting this technology from Western countries, which like uh, 
uh, they said like they align with human rights principles and exporting this technology to authoritarian countries, which using this technology against their people without proper regulations, without proper laws, without uh, without safeguarding, without even informing people about collecting their data. Right. Uh, so, so perhaps uh, that the creation and the development of the technology itself is not being done in the, in the region of the Middle East and North Africa, but uh, it's being implemented and used already there, right? So um, tell us more about that. Who's using uh, what technologies and for what purpose and uh, who are the main actors? Uh, um, give us an overview of your research results and what you have uh, discovered uh, and learned so far about the use of the technologies in the region. Yeah, uh, I'll, 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 there is the use of technology in MENA, you mean? I could, I could get... Um, yes, please, yeah, yeah tell yeah. us. Yeah, the, the main use of this technology in MENA, and you could find it in, uh, in Israel, you could find it in Egypt, you could find it in UAE, you could find it in Arab Saudi. And the most important thing, like sometimes the UAE, the Emirates, exporting this kind of data, from Western countries, because they might be uh, hesitating in exporting this technology to Egypt directly. So they sell it to uh, UAE, which resell it again to Egyptian partners. So it's like, it's like um, you know, uh, a helping network to uh, enforcing or to implementing this kind of technology in these countries. We could say like, um, in Israel, for example, the Israel military uses facial recognition technology to target Palestinian and journalists and activists, lead, which leading to arbitrary detentions. And the Israel security hired the NIS company to install facial recognition technology in Jerusalem and, and all city, which has a reputation of spying and violating human rights, as we all know about it. In addition to it, uh, the most private security sector companies that work in facial recognition technology in Israel are led by former intelligence officers in Mossad who, who, working, who worked before in Mossad, which shed lights on the nature of relationship between Israel security and these companies. Okay, very interesting. Yeah. Yes, we could talk about uh, we could talk about UAE at like um, according to reports, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, just like I'm, I'm gonna show the. You've prepared yes. uh, some slides, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it is it clear? Yeah, I, I can see it clearly. Yes, yeah. Uh, UAE, according to reports, the United Arab Emirates has been using many facial recognition cameras in public place. In 2019, Dubai police announced an artificial intelligence surveillance program called Ayun, which utilized tens of thousands of camera with facial recognition software and microphone that feed back into one central command center. So this is in 2018, it was 10,000. 2019, this camera, uh, this facial recognition, the number of facial recognition technology cameras reached 10,000 instead of 8,000. And in 21, it becomes 300,000 camera oh, wow. monitoring Dubai around the clock. That's a steep increase. Exactly. exactly. Huge investments. And exactly. They invest heavily in this kind of technology. And you could see the effect of this technology on, on public life in arresting people because they, they, they monitoring people movement. They, there is a report for Amnesty and Human Rights Watch talking about how UAE using this technology in monitoring people movements and of course, arresting uh, dissidents and oppositions. And like it's silent the community and it's silent uh, the, the society and that's what they want. The chilling effect of surveillance. Exactly, exactly. Right. It's, it's the, the untrusting of each other, the 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 the, the fear of fear of expression, the freedom of expression or doing anything. And it's not only that, Ahmad. It's like when you become aware of the facial recognition technology and how it's work, you will not only be uh, in a risk of ident be identified by this technology, you will be 
and risk of misidentified by this technology. Because mm. sometimes it's it's not only it's like it's um it's identified it's misidentified persons like like and with with different characters or name because the the inefficiency of this technology. This technology is, is still inefficient because of the bias in the tra data training that uh, hmm. training the machine learning on how to identify uh, faces and people the bias in data training and if you if you if you so if you think about like how many how we 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 didn't invent this technology in our region we exported from different country like china like usa like like britain and we 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 import this technology and and apply it on the people which is trained on different data and even when we train it, when we train this data on data like it's gathered by by on our countries or for, from egypt or emirates or saudi arabia we we first this data is biased because you have already bias um, uh, power dynamics and most of the data will be for men most of the data will be with the majority of people not for the all for them it's not representative it's not for representative for everyone in this society and okay. this is about the data going to the efficiency of like and the ability of identifying people if the light angle changes this mm -hmm. is gonna this this is gonna result this is make a a false result or 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 misidentified people also so mm -hmm. there is there is a lot of problem with identifying people and misidentifying people and this is well if if i'm if i'm fear of misidentifying i already i'll avoid engage or being in the wrong places from the government point of view i'll 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 avoid going to protest for for the fear of being misidentified and for the fear of being identified too so so even if you think that your behavior and action is uh, is in, in compliance of the law you will be afraid that you may be misidentified for someone else's and blamed for their behavior yes. and in countries where uh, basic uh, political and and um, and human rights are not protected, you would be also in fear of being identified actually for your and being blamed for for your actions and and uh, activism, uh, exactly. or or and or in fact you're you're raising a shocking point here that the proliferation of, of face recognition technology could also be seen on its own as an effective means of social control with people not wanting to be seen in public with certain others. Uh, and and this would, in this case, be taking a new, a new totalitarian uh, meaning. Uh, you, I mean, without face recognition technology people are usually um, aware of the of the company that they are with and uh, wanting to be seen with uh, let's say reputable people but in this case the the overall um, um, monitoring of society makes this it just takes it to another uh, different level uh, i mean yeah um, so and this, yeah. and this, without talking about LGBTQ people and community yeah. and yeah, how this technology like affects them, like if you are, if you are, if you are like, of course, like we don't have this like parity for people like to to walk in the streets like a drag queen or whatever. But yeah. imagine if you are like decided to express yourself by different way by the norm right. by different norm. How the how how the how the this camera will will identify you basically they will not identify you and they will send the alarm to the security so it will put you in risk of being a gay person and of being misidentified so it's like it's like it's risk from everywhere yeah, uh, uh, and we're talking here about uh, countries that still uh, sees uh, uh, um, uh, expression of uh, gender and sexual identities that are not mainstream as uh, as crimes or as uh, in violation of the law or yeah. uh, norms or uh, regulations. But um, even yeah. if you are in the airport and going to UK and the camera didn't identify you because you are wearing differently or controversially, 
it will notify, it will alarm the security, and you will be, you will take much, much time more than anyone else, like white people, white, white person, like going smoothly and easily because they are not controversial. So it's add a burden on the people, even in Western countries or in, in our region. You would be singled out uh, for inspection and uh, exactly. uh, close uh, uh, yeah, uh, checkups by the authorities. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, okay. And um, um, what about if, um, can we also uh, can you tell us about other uh, uh, countries in the region? We've talked uh, about uh, Israel and UAE. What about uh, back home? What about Egypt, for example? Oh, What's happening yeah. there? <laughs> Our favorite country. <laughs> yes, it's like, it's like, to be honest, it's like a mess. And it's like a mess for people. And it's like a golden opportunity for governments. Because where else you could apply this kind of technology without laws, <laughs> without being, without being, be, being informed. And even if people being informed, they couldn't even resist. They couldn't even object to what to what you to what the to what they under because it's already an authoritarian country and military regime. So you can do anything. But recently we started be, and and I wanted to to say something here because to get information out of Egypt is so difficult because it's like an opaque wall. And only information that we could get, it's like through the international reports, through harvesting data and news, finding patterns from for arresting people. Uh, the companies who the companies who are selling this technology sometimes they release a report in uh, in UK or you could find these deals on their websites. So we recently found like that Egypt uh, using this the facial recognition technology in prison and uh, to monitor inmates and this technology has been used to identify and attract prisoners and criticize for violating human rights from the from the human rights organization in in 2019 the government reportedly installed facial recognition technology in torah prison complex uh, known for holding political prisoners Human rights organizations have expressed concerns that this technology is being used to monitor and suppress political deciding dissident. Egypt um, using yeah. yeah. Yeah, go yeah. ahead, sorry. And 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 you know, you know exactly how the situation now in Egypt politically and how many people like we know is personally in the Torah complex. So and you don't know if the if these people, of these prisoners know that they are under facial recognition technology camera. They know that they are under CCTV, which is they saw it, but mm. they didn't know that they are under facial recognition technology. And that their their images is uh, are being taken and stored probably forever, as far as we are concerned, and you, being you processed in order to identify them in completely other situations from where they have been recorded in the first place. Is this correct? Yes, and 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 surprisingly, we don't know for how long this data will be stored because. It's the law, we have a data protection law recently, which is data not protection law. Mm. It's not no protection data law, which like you can, you didn't know the regulations for storing data for how long and where, where they gonna store the data and who has the right to access this data. So right. it's, it's, it's basically, it might be like under the, this data will stored with a, with a kind of the governmental employee he could he could access this data and show it to any to anyone else. He they could sell it. They could they could uh, uh, like disclose it to uh, to uh, to to media, to relatives, to uh, to to friends, and you don't know, and you will not be able to know because there is no regulation, no oversight, no accountability. So, so it probably could also become uh, another commodity subject to the terms of corruption and being sold to beneficiaries that were not probably intended by the original use by the uh, security apparatus when they first introduced these systems in order to um, control the population, but also from their point of view to uh, help them do their um, uh, job in maintaining uh, safety and security, but it could also end up like like we have seen in in many of the 
uh, uh, backdoors and uh, uh, um, security uh, holes in systems that were intended for safety, but they end up being used by the wrong people for the wrong reasons. So you're saying that this could also be the case with the information about facial recognition systems. Exactly, and you we have we have recently in 2019 a law of like force every everyone on every shop in public place or events to uh, to use uh, CCTV cameras and we and and to store their data to store the data in their places and without it you and to inform and to transfer this data to the police uh, to the nearest police station and now you have uh, a shop manager have an access to your photos and access to your data you don't know about it you don't know who has the access. You don't know how they're going to use it. And you have no right to delete or restore this kind of data. So it's mm -hmm. like, it's like, to be honest, this is a heaven for training data or a heaven for, for collecting, for gathering the people's data because nothing there. And with the data protection law, it's like, it's like ironically, they, they exhibit the national security uh, 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 entities and 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 intelligence entities and the central bank from the data protection law. Imagine. So, uh, um, how is this whole operation uh, managed or governed? Um, what controls? What legal? What legal framework uh, is there to? I mean just govern and who's responsible for it is it only the executive branches of government uh, are there any forms of uh, public oversight uh, parliamentary oversight uh, judiciary uh, controls i mean how is it how is the system on the political level and on the on the on the rights level uh, being uh, governed can you give us just a I mean, I don't know how much is known for sure and how much is um, uh, unverified information that we obtain. But uh, as a researcher, I'm sure you have some insight into that. Can you tell us more about it? Okay. Theoretically, theoretically, we have uh, in the Constitution, Constitution, we have a Privacy Act. Practically, we have nothing. Theoretically, we have a data protection law. And practically, it doesn't apply, and they didn't use it until they want to use it. And even with the data protection law, it's like no regulations of the installation if, if the installation of the surveillance camera, and whether in public and private spaces for government and private use, and there is no safeguarding procedures or oversight bodies to protect people's data and privacy. Basically, the collection of citizen data from the government government's body, websites, and telecommunication company is happening without people consent, and there is no visible uh, practice for the the right to privacy. And uh, server, as you know, with the telecommunication even uh, regulation, service providers must provide all the necessary data and uh, cooperate with the law enforcement agencies. But it's like the Central Bank of Egypt and national security authorities are exempt from the data protection law. The cybercrime law forces telecommunication companies and internet service providers to store data for 180 days and the grants authorities access to it. Hmm. Yeah, this is this is overall about all the, the legal framework that work or not working in Egypt. Right. So uh... This is about the legal framework. Uh, what about the technology itself? Do we know where it is um, imported from? Who are the main vendors and providers of the infrastructure, the systems? Uh, uh, I, I know that uh, China is a major uh, maker and exporter of such technology and perhaps expertise as well. And I know also that China is a, is a model that many countries aspire to uh, with um, perhaps uh, a huge difference in the capabilities and uh, uh, resources available and, of course, the political uh, uh, 
context and uh, uh, environment. But uh, what do we know about where, where Egypt gets its systems from? It's, it's it, yeah, what we, we know, what we, yeah, it's, we know some countries and some companies uh, are exporting this kind of data to Egypt, but we still, we, we have to say like, it might not be all the, the, the picture like, like we have, because we still have no, we, as you know, we don't have something like called access to information to Egypt. So we will not be able ever to have the accurate and to do that, to, to, facts the real facts of this of these trades unless they someone leak it or publish it but we 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 know for sure like that that egypt exporting this technology and depending heavily on china on on, on exporting this technology from uh, from companies like uh, like uh, high vision sense time and uh, dahwa and i want to 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 say something for Dahwa specifically, because Dahwa is the most like Dahwa was in the blacklist of the U.S. Uh, technology company from from not being uh, from from not exporting their their technology or the the Dahwa technology or not allowed to work in USA because okay. there is there is a kind of violation of human rights because Dahwa company one of the companies that uh, created the code which applied on the Uyghurs. Uh, community in China and the code okay. of recognition the uh, face of the Uyghurs so they could identify them uh, among any population and they could recognize them wherever they go and it's important to know that the same company who, inv who created this code and working with this uh, facial recognition technology Egypt is, is importing this technology from them so okay. there is there is important question two questions here first the data training on dahwa or in dahwa technology it's uh, it's it's uh, for eager faces or chinese faces so how it could how it could apply to the egyptian faces second we we heard about many times about incident of deporting eager people from egypt to china and handing them to the Chinese authorities. So is it mean that the Dahua and the Chinese authority working with Egypt in identifying Igu's population in Egypt, which means this is a huge human rights violation. So it's it's not only risk people's life in their countries. You 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 now you you some some people of population like they they fled them they fled from china to 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 countries like egypt to find the same technology deploy it and working on their faces to identify them whether monitoring their movement or to arrest them like what happened in egypt and deporting them again to chinese come to uh, to china we know we know right. yeah yeah uh, the risk the, the risk the risk of the company that uh, that the Egypt exports this technology from its IBM and NES Corporation, which is Japanese, uh, uh, they from US from uh, and from Amazon from Google. They using all these softwares and they 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 export the technology and they export the the machines itself. Um, so. Uh... China has has created this technology for racial profiling of its uh, Uyghur exactly. population, and it's being mm -hmm. exported to Egypt. And do you think that uh, because of these abilities that China has developed, that it's uh, developing similar racial profile profiling te technologies for Egypt, or uh, is Egypt just depending on uh, on on what's it what's it getting from China without um, without um, uh, inspecting or uh, analyzing the, the ramifications of the te types of technologies that they get uh, to implement into the country. Uh, and this applies for other, for other uh, countries as well. H how does the industry work here? I mean, do, do manufacturers um, tailor their products for the uh, importers for their customers, I mean, uh, in different uh, governments of the world, or is this something that has to be uh, undertaken within uh, the receiving uh, side of the deal 
yeah. how does the industry work? It, it's from my, yeah, as, as we don't know exactly what's happening, but I could imagine like Egypt using, Egypt exporting the technology and exporting the, the software and exporting even the, the data with, with its data training, but Egypt already has no problem in collecting and gathering data. So okay. they, had, they had their pool of data of people okay. facing, like it's everywhere, traffic, internet, and without with, without the fear of any um, legal oversight or whatever so they might they might they might training this technology on egyptian local food. data yes but okay we have to ask about the accuracy are we sure that they are doing this accurately second there is something called like uh, the ethical of data gathering third like I can, I, I, I'll not be surprised to know that it's a kind of the deal between China and Egypt because the there is they work like now as a partners. Like it's to 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 uh, to include the 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 code of identify the ego's faces in the Chinese te- in the, the the imported Chinese technology to I uh, to serve the Chinese interests. So I'll not be surprised to know something like that on the light of the arresting of Uyghurs, if Uyghurs and uh, uh, the Uyghur uh, uh, yes. uh, students in, in Al-Azhar. Exactly, in, in exactly, right. from Al-Azhar, yes, yes. Okay. So usually, usually, what happened usually, it's like with the deals, like when you do this kind of of um, of deals, you provide trainings. For uh, for the law enforcement or the for programmers or for engineers to be able to deal or to to uh, to operate on this technology. Okay, and um, I have a I have a question here, and then we'll take. Uh, I don't know if you can see the comment uh, from Tarcisio about Brazil, but let me ask you first uh, because I, you've brought something to my mind here. What about uh, regional cooperation between governments in the region? I mean. Um, do we know that, for example, governments of the region, uh, we, we know for sure that they exchange uh, uh, intelligence information amongst themselves about uh, actors, uh, political activists, uh, human rights activists as well. Do we know that they are also exchanging expertise and data sets and uh, their experiences with the facial recognition systems uh, within the region? Does, is this happening? Or is it simply that we don't know yet? Or I'm just curious to know what we know about this. Uh, to be honest, uh, we don't. We know by incident, by creating the pattern. So we don't know, but on the on the light of the relationship with countries like UAE and Egypt and and uh, and Saudi Arabia, why they couldn't together cooperate in something like that and exchange their data especially we have that they have a, they have a, a security and arrangement between each other so why they didn't why they will not doing that it it, it it comes to that there is country like uee like exporting data or importing importing this technology then resell it with different prices cheaper to country like Egypt to help them this is of course come with the deals with the security and intelligence deals so i'll not i'll not even 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 doubt like a level of cooperation between and partnership between each other um, okay and um Tarsisio's comment here and questions actually uh, 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 they bring on uh, something that I uh, a question that I had uh, down the road, but I think we could also tackle it now. Um, uh, it's about uh, the uh, the possibility of uh, organized uh, efforts to completely ban. Uh, the use of facial recognition technology. Uh, is this even possible? Uh, uh, there is a link uh, posted by Tarsisio about uh, a campaign uh, to, in order to, uh, to ban 
and impose a, a moratorium on the technology itself. And then there is a question, a very good question about uh, whether the banning should be on uh, police and government and security apparatus use only or, sh or should it be extended as well to the private and public spaces uh, under uh, civilian or non-police uh, uh, management or authority. Um, so I, I, I will take from this and uh, perhaps uh, uh, rephrase the question, what, what, what's possible? What can we do uh, about uh, all of this, not only in Egypt, but in the region as a whole, taking into consideration the legal and political context? Uh, we know very well that since uh, the Arab Spring, uh, uh, the power has shifted greatly and huge uh, investments into policing and control uh, has been exerted into all of the of the region and this is uh, also also an international phenomena but we have been witnessing an increase in, in the region with that regard uh, so within these restrictions uh, what's possible what can be done what uh, let me say what, what's the ideal what, what ideally should be done about this sort of technology that, as you have laid for us, uh, 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 is a threat to, to uh, freedoms, to political freedoms, to social freedoms, and to, uh, I would say, to, nat to the natural development of societies. Uh, what, what should ideally be done and what can practically be done uh, in order to control it? Uh, I'm not sure if banning is the, is the solution or or is it possible or is it desired? Um, I don't know, but tell me what you think about that. Okay, uh, for the first part of the questions about the, the campaigning against special recognition technology, as you said, starting from 2011, uh, the protest is the main fears for the Egyptian government or for the uh, Arab government. So the facial recognition technology has ability even to predict the movement and to predict the, the, the gathering of people before they gathered. We saw that in 2019 and Egypt arrested more than 10,000 people from the around the, the Tahrir Square during the calls for uh, protesting, which, which led by Muhammad Ali, one of the exiled oppositions. So the, the security arrested people around Tahrir Square and two days after the, the calls from people's homes. And this is because they predict the, the ability of this technology is extreme. There is ability of this technology to identify the big the beginning of the protest and the end of the protest. They have this kind of the, the ability and the, to scan all the protesters and the ability to predict where they gonna go, how they gonna gather like like it's something saying everything from above and predict people movement that they gonna gather at certain points. So this is a point to this is a moment to uh, interfere and arrest people and prevent them to 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 gather. In countries like Egypt, UAE, Saudi Arabia, I can see Iran. You also have Iran, a, a, a... <laughs> of course, Iran. I can see the on the ground movement to opposite opposite this kind of technology without uh, risking people's lives, not people's security also. Even, uh, but if we if we talking about like practically solutions, we have to we have to focus on the international players who feed the monsters, who feed okay. these governments. So it's about like okay, the, this this government is not rich. Our govern Egyptian government not rich. Someone supporting them with this technology. So. Working on international bodies like uh, United Nations, EU, uh, EU Parliament, and working through the stigmatized companies who ex who are exporting this technology to this country to the to the authoritarian countries. There is many way to harm these their business with creating coalition, creating um, creating a campaign, an international campaign, and we have an evidence that this kind of stuff work it before especially with israel like when the microsoft having a deal with israel to apply facial recognition technology in the occupied land with a campaign like comfort com comforting 
uh, uh, IBM or, or, or Microsoft with their pledge to human rights principle, they cancel the deal. So we could do something like that if, we, if, if these companies feel the risk of losing their reputation or losing their profit or business. And, and, and the, the, the other point is to help this Western country to the accountability by their people by working on campaign on Western countries like, like France, which banning, France is banning the facial recognition technology in public, in public places. At the same time, they're exporting this technology to countries like Egypt, which is hypocrisy. So how is this going to work? The second part of the question, uh, yeah. Can I go ahead, please? Yeah, the second part is about like the ban or not ban. From my point of view, personally, I'll never trust the governmental use of facial recognition technology. And we should, but there is another point, like once this technology is out, it's out. You can't get it back. You can't, you can't, you can't ask people to stop using it. But you can limit, you can make an oversight, you can make an accountability, you can you can ask even the if it's I from my point of view, we have to ban it in public places, we have to ban it in governmental the governmental use. And in case of like they want to investigate something incident or whatever, it should come through uh, uh, a request to the local authority or the local community to give them the consent of, of, of being access to certain data and time and not a live feeds, not uh, all, the, all the data all the time. It should be limits. Uh, from my point of view, I can't trust. I can't trust the, 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 the extreme uh, access to, to people's data. And people should be having the right to request their data, to delete their faces, and to know for how long it will be stored hmm. with the private companies. So uh, uh, do you imagine uh, a global effort to create uh, a global framework of governance for this and other types of technologies that threaten uh, uh, freedoms uh, uh, and, and, and violate privacy around the world. I mean, we know that there are efforts, at least, to globally control uh, different sorts of weapons, for example, uh, yeah. nuclear weapons, chemical weapons. Uh, should face recognition technology also be uh, organized and controlled on the international level? And um, would, would there be interest from the major uh, powers of the world who are eventually the creators and the technologies and the most um, uh, and the most uh, benefiting from their exports uh, eventually um, how, how do you see the, the dynamics here uh, playing out uh, if such an attempt uh, was to be called for I don't want to sound hopeful or optimistic. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> Give us some. <laughs> but I could say, like, I, I believe, like, especially, but I'll take, like, it's an international level, or Western level, there is a strong movement against facial recognition technology. There okay. is a push and push back. People have a ground of fight. The point and which is so disparate that we don't have the same in MENA. Mm. We don't mm. have we 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 don't have even the big picture. We are trying to make a big picture like like the Western country who who like who are, who like promoting their freedom principles or human rights principles. If the same country involve it in weaponizing the authoritarian countries with such technology. So I think that we have we have to work to widen this kind of international campaign. It's not only applying this technology; it's 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 specifically about the Western country who supporting these authoritarian countries. So uh, th there is a comment here from Tarcisio as well, saying that in Brazil, Microsoft tries to push and sell technologies that are suspended in USA, yeah. like oh. emotion recognition in visual exactly. computing. Exactly, exactly. See, see, like this is this things like it's it's like makes me feel like what? How do you think? Like, like uh, Microsoft banned in in using in public place in USA, and okay, they don't mind to use it 
in Brazil? And what about it's it should be a base, it should be like a rule, like if it's banned in somewhere, it should be banned all over in okay. all over other places. And if we if we are to if countries like banning using this technology in public places, why are you exporting this technology to different countries that has no regulation or safeguarding of using this kind of technology? So it's kind of a, it's it's really it's really mad. But but I think this is also the, the the conversation that's going with so many other things with with AI now with uh, again with uh, weapons of mass destruction that uh, are uh, let's say are leaking from uh, gra- uh, battlegrounds and being uh, smuggled across borders to be used in areas that have no relationship to the uh, original destinations where the manufacturing countries uh, sent them, uh, for example, for the war in Ukraine, we see weapons emerging in other places in the world. And this global network of, of, uh, of beneficiaries of, uh, of uh, these technologies uh, it's hard to control for, or what do you think? I mean, there will always be someone willing to make some extra money by selling someone else what they need regardless. Uh, yes, we will not be we will not be able ever ever to 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 pan it or to complete control it, but at least we have to put some legal, make it harder for people, make it like to make it like harder, more difficult, and more risky for them to do this stuff. More sanctions, more legal framework, more like uh, like more harm for this for for the companies like. They couldn't control the the use of this techno of their technology, and in in a point I can't believe this. I can't I can't literally believe it because I think there is something with software. It 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 informs the companies where it has been using. So it's not it's not that difficult to to follow or track where this technology goes, and it's not it's not like uh, impossible to uh, to just to disable the software anywhere so it's always okay. the solution but it always need a willing to apply this solution well uh, thank you for the for uh, ending on a, on a high note uh, sarah and uh, um, it's it's in accordance with what uh, uh, Darcy has been proposing us to participate to here. Uh, and the link is in the chat if anyone wants to take a look at it. Yeah. Um, and thank you for the information and insight. Um, um, uh, do you have any other comments? Uh, anyone that you would like to share or add or ask? Uh, it would be uh, greatly appreciated also to uh, share with us your uh, knowledge about the subject in your countries or in any campaigns and efforts that you have participated or taken part uh, in uh, regarding face recognition technologies. Um, and let's all be um, involved in the global conversation that's taking place now and inform ourselves. Uh, thank you again, Sarah, for helping us uh, understand the situation better. Uh, Thank you all and um, enjoy the rest of your uh, sessions in uh, Mosfest. Uh, thank you, Ahmed, for, you, uh, for being here and thank you for your moderating. It was a big It's been pleasure. a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for the information. I'm going to get it uh, copy paste now. Goodbye. Yeah, I love it. Bye. Uh, you should end the. Yes, I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm trying to shut it down, but it won't. It's alive now. It's alive. It's